Blockchains are very good for financial style applications where you have like a continuous flow. But if you all of a sudden have tens of thousands of people doing one thing at one time, can't blockchains blow up? Um, look at the other side I mean, on Ethereum a few years back, it completely blows up blockchains. So I think for us, that's why we kind of built the blockchain in the first place to solve this fundamental problem we had. The other thing as well is we've taken a very different approach to a lot of other chains. A lot of other chains out there are going for what's called a parallel approach. This scales very well when you don't have everyone interacting with the same account, smart contract, or piece of state at the same time. The problem is when you think about the metaverse use case, so if you think about like the other segment, that's all of the same pieces stay at the same time. And those parallel approaches don't really scale very well for those. So we've taken a very different approach with sequential scaling, which we think will be much better for the first use case of gaming and metaverse uh, than other chains are there today. We're sitting down with Paul just an hour before Token 2049, and we have the opportunity to talk about Somnia and his journey into the web three. Thank you so much for joining the podcast. No worries. Uh, we were just bonding over London and how you uh, how you flew uh, to Singapore from there. Uh, you're born and bred there, but tell me about not there actually up north, but tell me about your journey into crypto and uh, how did you get into it? Yeah, so I um, started off. So I was a very early member of this company called Improbable. We did gaming and metaverse technology. So we basically sold technology that enabled massive online virtual worlds, the games industry, for many, many years, uh, and then pivoted into metaverse, where we kind of made stuff for real-world applications like sports, music, and fashion. Um, and so back in 2016, 17, I was a big proponent of us starting to move stuff more on chain, because this whole idea of the metaverse was about digital assets being bought and sold between people. And I was like, we should use blockchain to do this. We shouldn't put this on centralized databases. That means it's a global store where everyone can access it and everyone can use it. So I was pitching that internally a lot. Um, the technology wasn't really ready yet back in 2016-17. Uh, Ethereum was very early days and things didn't really work very well, I'll be honest with you. Um, so fast forward to 2020, that's when we really started to pick up a lot more on the metaverse side of things. And that's when we really started to look through on the blockchain side and really when I started my proper Web3 journey, I would say. That's when we started developing technology and developing what now is Somnia today. So say... I've been very crypto curious from about 2016, 17, and then been actually in the space, actually building from about 2020. Yeah, I've always been bullish on the metaverse. Uh, and we saw a big spike, especially with like Everyone, Sandbox yeah. and Facebook uh, renaming to Meta. But some might argue that it's dead now, so no one is making noise about it. Uh, what do you think is the reason that it went quiet? So now everyone's talking about real world assets, deep end, yes. uh, some other narratives are emerging. And I know that it's the nature of crypto. Um, it's like a narrative driven industry. Uh, but yeah, tell me, tell me more about it. And, and how do you feel about it? What, what's your take on it? Why has it gone so quiet? Yeah. So I think, first of all, metaverse is like a buzzword that doesn't it means a lot of things to a lot of people. So what I would say is the metaverse in the bigger sense has not really died at all. If you look at where consumers, especially Gen Z and Gen Alpha are spending their time, they spend all their time in Roblox and Fortnite. These are metaverses. There are experiences where they spend all of their time digitally. So this kind of concept of the metaverse is dead, I think is wrong. It's actually growing significantly. You're also seeing big brands kind of adopt it in terms of user acquisition, in terms of engagement. So it is growing a lot. I think what is slowed down a lot is the kind of crypto buzz around it. Like the big projects that came out in 2021, they're still kind of working on their core technology and still building up what they had promised, basically. So we've gone through like the peak of like hype cycle. And now we're in like what I call the trough of delusion, which happens a lot with technology. And now there's like a slow grind up of like more and more use cases and actual utility being made around the metaverse. I think you'll see more and more stuff come out. And then people start to realize, oh, this is a big thing. You also have big moves in AR and VR. I don't know if you've seen, obviously, the Apple Vision Pro. That obviously is changing the game a lot. And then yesterday, Snapchat came out with the new AR glasses. I don't know if you saw those. They don't look very good. Right. Um, but I definitely think this is kind of like a signal of where the technology industry is moving. And when the technology industry moves there, you'll see more people start building more assets and more things that can be used in those places. Um, and so I think now, whilst the hype cycle is definitely gone, the actual building is starting and actual real value and real creation is being done with major brands, with all these different platforms. So what I would say is, I don't know if the hype cycle is going to come back. Um, I think 2021 was quite a special time for the metaverse with meta changing its name and stuff like that. But the concept of it being dead, I think is kind of wrong. Um, I think just maybe in the crypto sphere, it's not as big as it used to be, but definitely in the global sphere, it's a huge deal. I completely agree with you that the metaverse is not dead. But what do you think are the main catalysts that will bring 
the next billion users? Yeah, so the billion user question is such a cheesy question. Um, yeah. So I think the first thing is the UX of Web3 has to get out of the way. So when a user is interacting with anything to do with Web3, NFTs, digital assets, digital currencies, that needs to be seamless to the user. They just want to ultimately go to an experience and have a good time at the end of the day. Now, but I think metaverse and gaming are these application spaces that can actually bring in lots of people, but not necessarily Web3 native and kind of bring them into the ecosystem. Now, what do I think those are going to be? I think there are a couple of things that are interesting for me. One side is kind of thinking about what we do in the real world and taking that into the digital world. So things that we do like digital concerts, where we kind of take uh, 3D motion cap imagery of a uh, performer, turn that into 3D uh, data in real time, allow people to watch a performer in a concert style environment, but in the digital space. That I think is a really good bridge because you get people who want to go to see, say, their favorite K-pop artists. They can now see that in the digital realm. And you're going to get hundreds of thousands of people who want to see that capable event that go there in the metaverse and then interact with Web3 Wells. The other one is sports, I think, is a big, big one, uh, where basically people going to watch, say, a football match or a baseball match, uh, kind of watching that in digital space, I think is a huge place to bring in a lot more users. Uh, we currently work with Major League Baseball, where they're doing digital baseball events. I think that's going to be a big, big space as well, a big, big sector. The, the final one is gaming. Like, I think everyone kind of talks about this in space. Um, Games are ubiquitous now. I think there are over a billion people who play video games globally. And that kind of mega hit Web3 game, I think, will bring in a lot more people into the space very, very quickly, bring them onto Web3 Rails and allow them to interact. So I think those are the three major application spaces. I think that essentially what we're looking at is entertainment and gaming. These will be the spaces that bring in a lot more people, I think. And what do you think will be the killer application? Because you outline a few use cases, uh, but some people use the metaverse for work. Some people would just uh, interact with their friends within that environment. Other things that's very good for gaming. Um, what do you think would be the killer app that we would need to onboard with that? Yeah, so I, I think ultimately the metaverse is about connecting people. So getting people who maybe are digitally, are very different, uh, different places globally, but they can connect together digitally. And it also means that anyone can go to anything because all you need is an internet connection now. So it doesn't matter whether you're in India, in South America, in Africa, in Europe, in America, you can go to these places now. So I think for me, it's about these killer apps are going to be digital spaces that people want to go to, but they can't necessarily get to in the real world. So things like big music events where you have thousands of people gathering together in these large crowd style environments, we're obviously pushing that kind of angle a lot. Music, um, sports events where you have millions of people kind of gathering together to watch a sports event together. I think these are like mega killer apps. Um, I'm also personally quite bullish on the AR angle because I think what you get with AR is you can augment the real world experience. So, um, with digital experiences and make that more compelling and more interesting. So that's another form of the metaverse. I think a lot of people think of it as just virtual reality, but I think augmented reality is going to be a big space, which brings on a lot more users as you kind of see augmented reality glasses becoming more of a thing. Snapchat just came out with their new glasses yesterday. They look a bit clunky because the tech is early, but I think technology people, we're, this is being a massive investment in the technology industry in general, and you're going to just see this trend continue. Um, I'm personally not very bullish on the work case scenario. Um, I think at the moment, it's just not as good as being in person, and you're never going to, you're not going to replace that. We, we at Somnia, we're actually a globally distributed team, and so I've always tried to work through how do you make a kind of workplace culture when you're all kind of geo-distributed. So we actually hang out a lot in the metaverse and kind of be there together, play together. We actually game together quite a lot in metaverse style experiences. I think that's a really nice way for people to connect and be together and kind of socialize. But in terms of actually doing work there, kind of on a whiteboard and stuff, it's not quite there yet. I think we need a few more generations of hardware technology who are really ready to kind of work in the metaverse. But I do see it uh, ultimately, but I think we're still a few steps away from that. So for me, it's going to be the entertainment and, sport, uh, and gaming style experiences, which really put in a lot more users much quickly. You mentioned music events and social gatherings, and I know that some people would attend uh, virtual events within Roblox, and it's quite popular among the younger generation. Um, I played a few video games there, but I don't really get it. Uh, I grew up playing AAA video games, so I think it's a bit clunky, but also it, it, it's just weird. I, I don't get it. It might just be my age, showing my age here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but do you think that we would need that three-point experience to onboard the average person? Because I consider myself Web3 native, but even I don't get it. So now imagine people that are not even within the community, they'll be a lot more skeptical. Um, yeah, what, what do you think would need to improve? What do we need to enhance to get to that level? Yeah, so 
I, I totally agree with you on the Roblox thing. I have the same thing. Like I, I'm in the space. I, I personally don't get it. I think what we don't get is this is a place where people hang out. They socialize together. They can just be together. And because if you, all your friends were there, you would probably hang out there a lot more because your friends aren't there. You're looking at more as like a gaming entertainment experience where it's not that good compared to say a AAA video game. Um, so I think the question is, what's the next step? And also, how do you onboard the next set of people? So I do actually think fidelity is very important. So we push this at Improbable when I'm squared, where having these higher fidelity experiences that feel more realistic, I think will be much more compelling to, say, our, our audience and kind of even older generation. But I think it's also just access modes. I think a lot of the time, if you look, look at a lot of metaverse applications today, you even need a gaming PC or a very high-end phone. And really, we need to think about experiences that can be accessed by anyone on any device. I think the big thing that we've been looking at is just TV screens. So if you think about a 50-year-old, like much older than us, they sit all their time in front of the TV rather than on their phone or on the PC. So you really want to get access to these experiences through the TV to get access to those people. And then you need to think through ways where we can get access on any mobile device because that's, that's the most ubiquitous device in the world where anyone can just be on their mobile device hanging out with a low internet connection and being in these spaces together. I think basically it's about broadening access to a lot more people to really uh, get a lot more people involved. And then you mentioned that actually that's the social ex experience within these virtual worlds. And are you concerned that the new generation will be spending a lot more time on their computers? Um, it's an argument that my grandpa would do, yeah. make, uh, but I, I think it's a fair point, especially because a lot of big brands are getting into it and they're trying to monetize it. And we all know what happened when we pour a lot of money into an industry. Um, so that could potentially be a downside to it. And are you worried about it? Or do you think it's just the natural course um, and the, there's nothing we can do to stop it? So, so I have this conversation with my friends all the time because I'm obviously pushing this kind of people being more in the digital realm. Um, one thing I would say, first of all, is that I don't see a world where we just live inside the digital spaces all the time. They're supposed to augment your real life experiences and make them more compelling. So say you wanted to go to a music concert, but you can't, and now you can because you have access to this digital method. That's what it's more about than just replacing the real world. Um, the other thing I would say is we are already becoming very digital native. If you look at your screen time on your phone, it's hours and hours a day for people. Um, but the people with the current kind of experiences that we have through social media are feeling more and more isolated. They don't feel as connected as they do with other people because you're just looking at a piece of text and you don't actually feel that person-to-person -person connection. And I feel like these richer digital experiences that you can have through the metaverse actually can create that deeper, more meaningful connection than what you kind of get through just like social media and texting people. So I, I, I personally think it will be a better world that we'll feel more connected to each other in a more immersive environment than what we currently have. And we spend so much time in this digital world already. Um, the other thing I would say very clearly is I see it as an augment. I don't want people to sit in their home all the time on these digital spaces. And this is why I'm such a big proponent of AR, because I think AR then mixes the digital and the physical so you can have that kind of in-person connection with that digital overlay that can kind of make the thing more immersive and more interesting. I should have probably asked this question earlier, but tell me a bit more about Somnia. I know that you guys are an L1. You support over 200,000 transactions per second, and you enable projects to build metaverse experiences supported by blockchain environment. Um, it's a very unique and specific use case of the blockchain uh, technology. So run me through the thought process of like, why did you decide to build this particular blockchain? But also, could you compare it to why should projects use um, your blockchain than Solana, let's say, because they have like comparatively high throughput as well. Uh, so yeah, two questions there. Why the thought process behind uh, building a blockchain that's specifically for um, the metaverse and why your blockchain over any other? Yeah, so the blockchain for the metaverse uh, basically came about from why we created it in the first place. So as I said, I used to work at this company called Improbable. We did metaverse gaming technology and services. Um, that really spawned these kind of large-scale experiences that I kind of talked about, the sports experiences, music experiences, and the kind of more metaverse gaming experiences. And the problem we had is we wanted every single digital asset to, in these experiences to be interoperable so it can move across all the experiences and also be backed by an NFT at the end of the day, so uh, on the blockchain. The problem we had was a scaling problem. 
we tried all the technologies that existed in the market at that point in time. None of them could scale to the capacity needed because blockchains are very good for financial style applications where you have like a continuous flow. But if you all of a sudden have tens of thousands of people doing one thing at one time, can't blockchains blow up? Um, look at the other side I mean, on Ethereum a few years back, it completely blows up blockchains. Um, even more recently with Solana, with all the meme coin craze, Solana has been getting very congested and had a lot of problems. I don't know if you're going to try to use that, but Solana became very unusable for a while because too many people at the same time doing stuff. Um, so I think for us, that's why we kind of built the blockchain in the first place to solve this fundamental problem we had. Um, but now, so in terms of why, why I'd say use Somnia versus a Solana, one thing I would say is um, we made a very conscious design decision to build it on top of the EVM. So that means that you can take all the existing assets that live on top of Ethereum, on top of the L2s, move that onto the Somnia blockchain. You can also, any code you've written in Solidity that will run on top of the Somnia blockchain. So we made a very conscious decision to stay inside the EVM ecosystem. The reason for this is one, there's a lot of developer tooling out there and kind of ecosystem that helps you build content much more easily on top of the EVM. I built technologies in the past where I tried to get adoption of a new programming language, a new paradigm. I tried to use the gaming industry. It's very painful and very, very hard. I would not recommend that to anyone. So we like, go where the developers are now. And also it's where all the assets are as well. So I think the key, one of the killer features is the EVM. The other thing as well is we've taken a very different approach to a lot of other chains. Um, a lot of other chains out there are going for what's called a parallel approach. This scales very well when you don't have everyone interacting with the same account, smart contract, or piece of state at the same time. The problem is when you think about the metaverse use case, so if you think about like the other segment, that's all of the same piece of state at the same time. And those, case, those parallel approaches don't really scale very well for those. So we've taken a very different approach to sequential scaling, which we think will be much better the first use case of gaming and metaverse uh, than other chains are there today. Yeah, and on that, do you think that every asset should be on the blockchain because you guys have such a high throughput? Um, what do you think is the best way for any company or any project that's building on top of you to do it? Do you still think that there will be some components that will be off-chain and only parts of it will be on-chain, like the assets that you earn uh, in the game? Or what do you think is the best approach for gaming studios to, to do that? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. So the transaction throughput of Somnia is beyond just having the assets on chain. What you can start doing now is moving the logic of objects that normally lives off chain, and moving that on chain. What that means is that logic now becomes interoperable and reusable across lots of different experiences. And it also means that people can modify that logic and change it. So you can create forks and mods of games much easier than you traditionally can. So I think the question you're asking is around what should game developers do? I think it comes down to what is the game you want to build ultimately. Um, if you're trying to build a super fast paced action shooter, like a Call of Duty style game, that I would not put all of the logic on chain. Um, it's not, you're always going to have latency trade offs and performance trade offs and moving it off, and moving it off chain. So that would always put off chain. Um, having the assets on chain still makes sense because then they become yeah. tradable and interoperable, blah, blah, blah. But logic should definitely not. I think for a lot of games, though, that are more strategic or slightly slower paced, that you can start to think about moving more of the logic on chain, which allows you to kind of create these ecosystems which more people can build off your initial content. Um, so what this means is, say, for instance, you built, I don't know, like a, a space simulator game. We have all the logic of how the spaceships work that runs on chain. Um, I now, as a user, want to make my own spaceship inside that game. I can take a fork of some of the code that exists in there and make my own spaceship and create my own content within that game. And the thesis here is around making games more moddable, um, which basically means more people can create stuff, which means we can find out, make more video games faster, which means you can find the fun much easier than what you can traditionally do in traditional game development. Um, I think there are some pioneers in the space at the moment. Um, e Frontier just got uh, announced a, a couple of weeks back, well, announced a while ago, but they started to release their white paper and a lot more content. And they're really taking this concept of a fully on chain game and showing what people can do with it. So that's kind of a really good example. You want to check out what you can do with this kind of stuff. Um, Pirate Nation is another game that I dropped there that kind of have all of their logic on chain and kind of are thinking about this fully on chain ecosystem of on chain gaming. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really good one. Uh, and you explained the utility of having everything on chain. Uh, you guys integrated a new feature called uh, Canvas Builder U. I just had to check my computer because I was like, oh, I know that you did it, but forgot the, the name of it. Uh, so yeah, could you tell me a bit more about it and how you enable 
uh, 2D assets to get easily integrated within your uh, blockchain and ecosystem? Yeah, so for us, interoperability is a very important pillar of the whole ecosystem. So you create a digital asset, an NFT, but then you associate the kind of 3D file and the logic with that, and that can move between digital experiences. So interoperability is a very important part of Somnia and part of our protocol. So the canvas builder is basically a way you can take a piece of 2D art and turn that into a 2D canvas that you can place anywhere within the Somnia ecosystem. So you can place that in a web-based world, which we call the playground. You can place that in one of these more richer 3D worlds I talked about, like Yuga Lab's other side of that. So basically it allows you to take a 2D piece of art and turn that into an interoperable uh, canvas that you can place anywhere in the metaverse. Uh, we also recently released the item builder. So this basically allows you to create a 3D item that can be used across all the different places in the metaverse. The avatar builder is something that we released a while ago. We can create a 3D interoperable avatar and use that all across the metaverse as well. And the next feature we'll be adding is what we call the world builder. So that allows you to build a world from scratch, which you can deploy into a web-based environment. Anyone can access and people can use, uh, which we really hope gives a lot more people access to building with the tool set and building with the content. So do you also provide the SDK to enable anyone to build on your blockchain so you made the experience for the game builders a lot easier? Yeah, so on the SDK side, so we haven't released the SDK for Somnia yet. Uh, that will be coming out in like the next month or so. Um, ultimately, if you're developing for Somnia, you'll be programming in Solidity code if you're building stuff on chain, so everyone should be aware of that. The other one, though, that's very important is our partner, M Squared, so the company that Cruz worked at. They have uh, this technology which allows for the thousands of people to be in the same space at the same time. Uh, they have a modified version of the Unreal Engine, which you can use to build content, um, very, very high fidelity content that's very, very uh, nice to look at and very, very like high quality. And that can be deployed into the ecosystem. You can bring in lots of users with that as well. So we have a lot of different options depending on what you want as a developer. If you want to go for a high fidelity experience, you can use that Unreal Engine mod. If you want to go for an easy access web-based experience, you can use our tool chain and our SDK, which we'll be releasing in the next month. Um, or if you're just an end user, you can just use our end user tools to easily like build your own little mini experience as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different options out there. Um, I think one big gap in our kind of offering at the moment is the Unity game engine, which we need to think, uh, we need to put an integration SDK into as soon as we can so people can start. There's a lot of people in the space of building with that game engine, so we need to make sure we enable that as quickly as possible. Yeah, and uh, you're still on testnet. Could you tell me a bit more about the roadmap when are you guys planning to launch mainnet? Um, and then, yeah, are you, what's, what's on the roadmap for you for next year? Yeah, so we're actually in uh, what we call beta net phase at the moment. So this is the initial launch of the protocol that enables the interoperability that I talked about before. And with that, we're kind of pulling in a community. We're getting to create content, create digital assets, create digital experiences, hang out together online. Um, so the next big phase for us will be our DevNet which we're currently looking at mid-November as a timeline to release that. So that'll be the first kind of public version of our blockchain out there. That DevNet will kind of have two modes. One will be a private DevNet, primarily aimed at early adopters and developers who are building uh, apps for the chain. Then we'll do some public tests where we do like a big load test, getting in as many users as possible to push the transaction limits and push the uh, performance qualities of the chain. Early next year, say like for every time frame, we're looking to go into testnet. And then mainnet, we're looking at end of G2 next year. Now, should caveat this, um, technology is always complicated and hard to build. Um, so don't set these dates in stone. These are current roadmaps. Things are likely to change. Um, but that's currently what we're working towards and what we're hoping to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. And how can people get involved in the DevNet, TestNet? Uh, what's the application requirement? Yeah. How do you select the people that will have access to those? Yeah, so at the moment, we're looking for two things. One we're looking for teams who are looking to build these kind of high-scale, real-time applications that are on-chain. So that could be a fully on-chain game. We haven't talked about other applications like fully on-chain social media, a central order book, like a DEX, basically, that is fully on-chain. So there are lots of different applications we're looking at. We're really looking for dev teams who are wanting to push the limits and kind of go beyond what you can currently do on existing blockchains today. Um, so there's an application process that will be launching in early September, uh, sorry, late September for that, uh, where people can kind of apply for that. Um, the other thing we're looking for is existing kind of ecosystem projects that are in the broader EVM ecosystem that want to kind of deploy onto our chain and bring in their user base there. Uh, we're interested in working with those because it kind of proves that we're compatible with everything else. It will just kind of work seamlessly. And the third thing is content creators who want to build this, these kind of gaming experiences or metaverse experiences with the tool chain that we're providing. Um, we have kind of application form online there. We can come in 
and start using the tool chain. You can use it today, but we will help kind of guide you through that process and work through that process. The other one that we're particularly interested in is NFT projects, uh, taking kind of 2D PFP projects, turning those into 3D interoperable avatars and allow them to be used across the metaverse. That's another place that we're looking to bring in more people into the ecosystem. So you can just go to our website, summoner.network. Uh, you can find all the kind of application forms there. And it's pretty straightforward. Nice. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I know that you'll be going to Token 2049. What are you hoping to get from this entire experience? And is that your first time in Singapore? No, no. So I was at 2049 last year. And um, so I used to work, I started my career in finance for my sins. And so I used to have to travel to Singapore for work a bit. Um, ultimately, the reason I go to these companies, I think it's quite interesting. I talk to founders and there are two types of founders in the space. One type who are very techie and very product orientated. And they're like, I don't want to go to events. I don't see the point. And I always kind of push back and I'm like, the point is you get to meet, you, there's no place that you can go and meet so many people in the space at the same time. You get to talk, have hundreds of conversations, really learn what is interesting, what people want, and then essentially find new partnerships and new avenues to work with people. And so that's basically what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get a pulse on what is kind of interesting right now, meet as many projects as I can in the ecosystem and kind of understand how we potentially work together and how we can help together. Um, then you have the other type of projects founders who are just all about the parties and stuff like that. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't go to the parties anymore. So I can't hack it anymore. Um, but as, as I said, I think there is no place in the world that has the density of crypto people doing these kind of events. And that's why I always make an effort to go to them and make sure I have some events as well. Nice. Thanks so much for joining the podcast. Pleasure talking to you.